I welcome our guest speaker today um, from Collins Aerospace. He's a principal engineer there in men's manufacturing. He's a process engineer, a chemical engineer from Purdue University with uh, a master's also from Purdue University. He's had 37 years in the IT industry and in particular with men's fabrication, 25 years with Delphi Electronics and then another 12 years with Collins Aerospace. He's been advanced development in the pilot line he has years and years of manufacturing experience. He has 33 patents and more pending. He's been married 38 years to me. I like him. And he's got six children and four grandchildren and one on the way. So he's been a very prolific man. Um, today he's going to tell you about MEMS, Microelectronic Mechanical Systems, which I hope you'll find very fascinating and inspiring. You too can be here one day. Do I have to keep this thing on? No, take it off. Nobody wants it. Everybody wants to see your face. <laughs> All right. Uh, my name is John Christensen. There's a couple of things, a uh, couple of things over here that you might be interested in. When we talk about MEMS, we are doing uh, fabrication on silicon wafers. Here's one. It's got a you know, cutesy pattern on it. It's not uh, MEMS, but anyway, you can, you can take a look at that. There are a couple other things here. Uh, this is, these are sil single, single crystal silicon uh, pools. Uh, you get a, you pull silicon out of a crucible, melt her down, and dump in whatever dopants you want, and uh, pull out a crystal like this. It's polished and then cut into slices to make the, uh, to make the uh, uh, slices that we use. This is a photo mask. It's been thumbed pretty badly. This is from a, from a, a VSLI, so not a MEMS, but an integrated circuit. This is probably an integrated circuit that went into a control system in a car. Another point. This is a, this is a, a, a frame on which a, a wafer has been put. Um, after you make all the devices on a single wafer, you can make between 75 and a couple thousand devices on a wafer, you have to saw them up and then get them off of there somehow. So the, the tape is what you saw them up on, and the tape holds the in it, the uh, individual die from falling off. You can see that? Then this is an extraordinarily poorly aligned uh, 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 heavens, uh, lead frame, sorry. Uh, you can see that there's a, a silicon circuit on the lead frame and uh, very poorly aligned. So if, if, you, if you look at a circuit inside a, inside a package, usually it's a black package and it has feet hanging out, you put the feet into the printed circuit cord. These are the feet or will be bent into the feet. And the, 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 uh, uh, the, uh, the die is there on, on, uh, on top and will be wire bonded out to the out to the world. And then finally, there's there's something in the back going around that's uh, a ceramic board. That ceramic board went into this uh, housing with a big old heat sink on the back. This is an ignition for uh, the North Star system for General Motors. The ignition meaning it drives the spark plug. So you'll see that it's a, there's a circuit, there's several ICs on it, and uh, it's filled with this uh, loop, which is sticky and rather nasty. But um, uh, Anyway, it, it, uh, the, the goop is an overlayer to protect it from uh, environmental problems. You can look at all those things. Oh, and then finally, yeah, this is cleaner than paper. It's not real paper, it's made out of plastic and it doesn't shed particles. And a clean room pen, I use these things every day. The clean room pen has uh, like no sodium, really low particulates, and uh, keeps us from having particular problems in the fat. Anyway, take a look at those things as they come around. Um, Becky already told you about me. That's what I look like a lot of the day. Uh, what are MEMS? Um, we're gonna talk about what are MEMS. We're gonna talk about some of the devices we make. We're gonna talk about feature sizes, which means how big or small are the things that we do. Talk about clean room operations and controls and, and the importance of not being contaminated. Uh, the importance of statistical process control. Um, we're gonna talk about some of the applications that uh, I do in Burnsville, or we do in Burnsville for aerospace. We're gonna talk about our pressure sensor technology 
and then I'm going to give you a few slides of free advice. All right, MEMS are micro electro mechanical systems. Uh, typically, um, they're they're based in silicon. Silicon is an excellent excellent material because it's got very well defined mechanical properties and very well defined electrical properties. Um, MEMS can be made very small. They can be rugged, they can be extremely precise, they can handle corrosive environments and have multiple uses. Here's a couple of the things that I've made or uh, I've been involved in. Single axis linear accelerators. Um, for instance, if you have an airbag in your car, you need to have you need to know whether you're bashing into something below that airbag. Now let's 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 talk about that for just a second. If you hit a metal stop sign, if you hit a stop sign, you're going to get a very quick, very high acceleration. Why? Because it's metal. It, it, it's like if you get bonked with a club, metal would probably take you out, wood would go a little slower and just kind of raise the lump. However, the stop sign will break off. So even though you have a very, a very high spike, uh, the, the, the spike doesn't last long. The car actually doesn't decelerate very fast and you don't want the airbag to blow. What if you hit an oak tree or a telephone pole? Well, as, as the car plows into an oak tree or a telephone pole, the, the tree itself gives, you know, kind of waves a little bit. You may dent the tree, the bumper dents. However, the car is going to come to a complete stop and fairly rapidly, and you want the airbag to blow. So you have to be able to tell the difference between a very sharp spike acceleration and a slower but sustained deceleration. This is this is one of those things that would do that for you. These, this is uh, you can see there's a, a vibrating ring on those springs, and then it has interdigitated fingers, and the, the fingers go like this, and they pick up capacitive signals. Uh, let's see, um, there are a couple other things that I'm going to show you. Um, things that I've worked on are single axis accelerometers, multiple axis accelerometers, pressure sensors, angular angular rate sensors like uh, like gyros, um, heat and IR sensors, microphones, um, fully tunable arrays. Those are kind of cool. Microfluidic valves, which which are the things if, if anybody know has a um, a friend that's uh, diabetic, the 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 uh, there are pumps that are inside that little packet there that will deliver, deliver micro uh, liters of uh, insulin directly to the patient. Worked on those things, worked on gas sensors, printer heads, micro machines with active circuitry. If you look in the background here, you see that the surface doesn't look flat, and that's because the signals cut that are coming out of this thing are in the femtofarad region, which means that they, they cannot be manipulated. So we have onboard, uh, onboard operational amplifiers there in order just to get the signal big enough so that it can be taken out to run to an amplifier in the system. Here are some of those things that you can make in MEMS. First of all, these are gears. And nobody really cares about gears because they don't really do much when they're, they're, they're extraordinarily tiny. Have you ever thought of how you switch light? pretty easy to switch electricity, right? You've got a switch and it's open and nothing happens and you close it and all of a sudden electro electrons flow, they're all happy and stuff and they go, well, how do you switch light? Well, you have this little micro mirror and it's on an actuator and light's coming down the path like this. When it's flat, it just keeps on going. You can pop this sucker up and obviously it it, the, uh, from old Snell's law, you know, the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection, and all of a sudden you're not going toward a sensor anymore, you're turning it off and on. Or you can route it between two branches in an optical fiber. This is a microphone. Microphones are kind of interesting. When they're so tiny, and I'm going to get to tell you about how tiny these are, you see that the top is perforated. Usually you have a capacitor in a microphone, and as the sound waves hit it, it it changes the gap on the capacitor. And when the gap changes, capacitance goes up, or when it gets smaller, it goes up. Well, it turns out that this has to be perforated. The top has to be perforated. And the reason is, is because if, if you think of an air hockey table, there's a layer of air between the puck and the table, makes it 
just darn near frictionless or seemingly so. Well, that same air has trouble uh, squeezing out from between the plates and will actually act as a damper. That's called squeezed film damping. You can imagine that if you have a capacitor in air, it can react fairly quickly. If you have a capacitor in water, it reacts a whole lot slower. And if you have a capacitor in toothpaste, it doesn't react very fast at all. It takes, takes like a maximum pressure, like a truck running over it, to get any sort of variation in the, in the gap. Well, on the scale that, that our MEMS devices are, which are extraordinarily small, air is about like toothpaste. It cannot make it out the edges fast enough for this to react to common frequencies like, uh, like voices. So you have to perforate it so there's a place for the air to go when it reacts. Um, I talked about, I talked about uh, micro pumps. Here's one. This is a pump for insulin. This is a cross section. That's the actual pump itself. And this is a picture of the, the uh, wafer that, uh, that the pumps are being made out of. So this is a cavity here. The pump actually is actuated instead of a speaker where waves come in and hit the speaker and cause the, the gap to open and close. Here we have an electronically actuated gap that causes the pump to pump. I want to talk about the top one there for just a moment because it's really vastly interesting. That's a printer head. You know how printer heads work? They're really simple. There are no moving parts. Behind, behind this surface here, there, the ink just sits there. And then each of those nozzles, you see the black holes, are just holes in the holes in the substrate. The ink's on the other side. There's a hole in the substrate. The ink doesn't come out because these are extraordinarily small, so you've got capillary action, just holds it in there. But they have, they have heaters, and each of those lines there is a heater, and it goes to a single port. When the heaters work, the heaters can heat up the ink to its boiling point extraordinarily quickly. The ink bubbles out and spatters, basically, as the head passes across a point. Do you know how fast these things can operate? They can heat and cool at 12 hertz, 12 k hertz, 12 kilohertz, 12,000 times a second. 12,000 times a second. They can heat up and cool down and spit out ink. So the heater head just passes across. It's got a bunch of holes on there, and you actuate whichever hole you need as you pass across. That's, that's how a printer head works. Pretty, pretty cool. No moving parts, no pump, no nothing. Just a heater. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about MEMS manufacturer. We do this in a clean room. Um, the, on a wafer like this, we may have 75 devices or several thousand. I think this, this guy probably had several thousand devices on it, or 1,500, I think. This is, this is more typical for a five inch wafer. This, this has several hundred. And then depending on the depending on the device and its use, you may you may have only 50. Or if you're making it like the, the sensor for the James Webb telescope that's going to be launched soon. Oh man, that's gonna be exciting when that thing gets up. They probably only made four of the detectors. Why four? Well, because they're hoping that something will yield, so you need more than one. And they, uh, they don't need many. They need the primary and then a backup in case somebody hits it with a hammer and it breaks. So they only made a couple. Um, so we can make a, a number of them. These, these are wafers. They're sitting in a quartz boat so that it can do high temperatures. You can put 75 to several thousand on a wafer. You have maybe 25 in a batch. This shows 25. You have between 10 and a thousand processing steps. Um, we have very long cycle times. It takes 80 days to make a wafer. So if you screw up early and you don't know it, then it's 80 days before you find out. That's a real bummer if you're trying to plan your business. After you get the wafer done, you have to package the devices. You have to put them in a package and then allow them to talk to the outside world. Uh, so there's a lot of processing that happens after that 80 days. Let's talk about a red blood cell and, and how big things are. These are the interdigitated fingers on a gyro device, and they, they form a capacitor, and the closer they come in, 
the higher the capacitance, the lower they come out, the less capacitance. This is a red blood cell. At the right size for this capacitor, you can see, first of all, it doesn't even fit in the interdigitated fingers. It's, it's too huge. Let's talk about it. There are like 250 million red blood cells in a drop of blood. 250 million. We're talking about a dye here that's about this big, about four millimeters square. The resistors that we use, uh, which are very huge compared to the resistors on that, uh, that integrated circuit that I passed around, are 10 to 25 microns wide. That's about three red blood cells. The conducting films that we use are four tenths of a micron. That's about a, let's see, it's a little less than a tenth of a red blood cell big. The, uh, the insulating films are uh, uh, another, another half a size less than that. In fact, the insulating films that we use are about the size of the COVID virus. Turns out COVID-19 uh, virus is a pretty huge one. It's a, it's a 0 .15, 1, 0.12 to 1.15 microns in diameter. The electrically grown film that I use for, a, for an insulating layer is 250 angstroms. Let's talk about that. Uh, a silicon atom is 2.6 angstroms tall. This is 250 angstroms. So it's a hundred atoms tall. Now here's the thing. Uh, the, the rule of thumb for particulate sizes that can bother you is 10% of your thickness, 10% of your smallest feature. Think of it on the road. If, if you hit a bump that's 10% of your tire diameter, you're gonna feel that sucker, right? Right? You got tires that are about this big, and 10% is about this big, you, you feel that, you hit that dead on, right? You probably damage your rims. So we have 250 micron diameter, uh, or micron, uh, not diameter, but thick, uh, minimum feature sizes. That means our, the, the size of the, uh, the size of a particle that can start bothering my devices is 25 angstroms. That's 10 silicon atoms stacked together, 10 atoms stacked together. That is a remarkably small amount. So we care a lot about particles. We care a lot. Uh, I'm gonna show you some of that. First of all, the way you can make these things without having particles is you have to have a clean room. The, uh, the contamination is so small it can destroy our stuff. So how do you get it out? Well, you continually sweep the room. You have filters up here. The filters uh, put laminar flow down. Laminar flow means there's no, there's no swirling. There's no moving of air. We don't have big vents that distribute it laterally so he doesn't freeze and she doesn't heat up. Actually, that never happens, right? He doesn't <laughs> heat up and she doesn't freeze as much more like it. But anyway, um, the, the, the particles go through humongous filters here. They're called HEPA filters, high efficiency particulate filters. And they can filter out almost all bacteria. The pore size is so small. In fact, they figure out, they do fil filter out some, um, uh, some uh, viruses. That's, that's how good those filters are. And they push the air straight down and have no swirling motion. So that if you've got a guy standing here and he's working on some uh, devices here, you got a guy here, most of, if a particle drops off his forehead, most of it goes to the floor and then comes out the bottom. So the, the bottom of the, the bottom of the clean room is actually the return air vent. Everything goes down below the top of the surface that you're working on and then goes in and then goes back in. And the, the air is then recirculated. In our clean room, we recirculate the air about six times a minute. So every 10 seconds, the entire volume of air is recirculated every 10 seconds. Now there's a couple of things that make that very interesting. We use a lot of interesting gases, including phosgene, which is a uh, uh, phosgene gas if you're a World War I type uh, guy. We use the uh, gaseous form of arsenic. 
Um, if you think about it, if we've got 85% recirculated air and a cylinder breaks loose and puts uh, phosgene in the air or arsine in the air, it's recirculated every 10 seconds. 10 seconds. How long do you have before you, you go, hmm, smells like dead fish in here and start uh, heading for the door? You don't have much time. If the alarms go off, whatever you do, you hit the door and you keep going until you get out in the yard. Very interesting. Um, the, the other thing is, is this is the cross section of a, a clean room and you'll see the air comes down and goes laterally. Um, the air in the, in the clean room itself not only goes down and goes laterally out the sides, but the length of the clean room cannot have current in it. So you have to balance the room. So we actually have louvers down here so that if this part of the clean room has a piece of equipment in the wall and blocks the flow, we have larger openings here to, to accommodate that so we don't get lateral flow. Here's what a clean room looks like inside. You've got all sorts of bays. Uh, people are wearing jumpsuits. Uh, the bays have the equipment in them. So you, you walk up and down the bay out of the way of your, out of the way of your product. Um, we keep our clean room at uh, 64 degrees. That's because you've got to wear a bunny suit over the top of your clothes and you're completely enclosed. We keep it at 45% relative humidity. Uh, the 85% recirc air, I told you about that. Now, the the, um, the uh, uh, filters are filtering out uh, most of the particles in the air. We have class 10 to class 100, and that means in a cubic foot of air, in a cubic foot of air, we have class 10 would be 10 particles, a half micron in size, so a tenth of a red blood cell in size. Now, how does that compare to anything? Um, operating, uh, operating rooms in hospitals have big filters, right? They kind of keep people clean so you don't open them up and then get a grand old infection in there. Those, those tend to be 10,000 particles, class 10,000. We're class so we're a hundred times cleaner, and in some areas of our clean room where it's critical, we're a thousand times cleaner than an operating room in a hospital. We keep the we keep the fab pressurized so that if there are any leaks in the walls or when somebody opens a door, air rushes out. Things don't rush in. We uh, we have to wipe everything off. Everything's interlocked. You can't go into a single door. You have to go into a door and then the other door is locked shut, then this door closes, then you can go out the other door. So we have door interlock. We, we, uh, people have to be fully gowned. So in our building, when you come into our building, you cross a sticky mat so you get junk off your shoes, then you enter a change area and you actually change your shoes into uh, building shoes. So you don't even have your own shoes on anymore. Then as you approach the clean room, we have our clean room entrances in the center of the building, away from the, from the hallways. As you approach that, you go across a second set of sticky mats to clean up your building shoes, the ones that you've never worn outside or anywhere else. Then you go across those sticky mats, go into the gowning room. Before you go into the gowning room, you put booties on top of your, your uh, building shoes. Then you put on a complete uh, gowning set um, put on gloves, and then you can finally walk in. There's actually more that you put on when you get inside. All our tools, everything, all the equipment comes in. We've got this huge room. It's about, oh, I don't know, uh, a third the size of this room. That, that is for when we bring in equipment, like processing equipment, big, big machines have to be wiped down and have to be unstaged in that room. Uh, we. We, we don't, we have this huge hallway, it's a hundred yards long from the rest of our, our manufacturing facility. We don't want people coming out. And when, when they must come out, we want that extra time for them to hammer stuff off their shoes as they're walking down the hall. And then we have a, we have a full maintenance squad just for our building. And they're specially trained to make sure that we don't contaminate things. Humans shed. 200,000 particles per minute, the size that would kill our devices. So as you're sitting there, you're just doing the pig pen thing from, from Charlie Brown. You ever see that guy walk? 
That's what you guys do. It's amazing. Uh, when, you, when you take a look at uh, a film that's, that's able to detect particles as a person walks, there are these big vortexes that come off a guy filled with junk, 200,000 particles. Think about that next time you run into your love interest. Anyway, so we have to wear Gore-Tex suits. Gore-Tex have very fine pores in them. It's basically a bag filter around the human. Um, we have to wear our PPE over our suits. So uh, we will, we'll have booties and boots on on top of that for a bunny suit, the suit on on top of that, and then we have to put on a chemical apron. We've already got masks and safety glasses, but we have to put on a chemical hood. And uh, on top of that, we have to put on uh, chemical gloves if we're gonna go into the chemical handling area. Everything sheds particles, but humans are the worst. Of course, machines that are humming along are generating particles too. So any, anything that we do, everything that we do is to contain particles and contamination. But we have other contaminants that can kill us. And remember, here's the problem. This is, this is big. If you, if you don't yield, <coughs> if you don't yield, then the company doesn't make a lot of money. The company doesn't make much money when you get fired. And if you get fired, don't have any money, you eventually don't eat it. And then you die. That is a bummer, and especially for me, because while I don't care as much about other people, I definitely care that I eat. It's just important, but it's not just the particles. There's chemical contaminants to silicon too. The alkali metals, like lithium and sodium and potassium, are poison, and they move. They're so light, they move in silicon. So if you have a capacitor, and you, you're, you're, you're expecting a change in the capacitance, say from a pressure sensor, you put pressure on this side and it changes this. And let's just pretend that's how you do, a, how you do an altimeter in an airplane. Actually, that's how you do an altimeter in an airplane. You have a capacitor and it's moving. Now pretend the capacitor has fixed charge on it, then you know how high you are. Pretend for a minute that when you bias up the capacitor, it starts attracting positive charges because you've got a negative charge on the bottom plate. What does that do to the capacitance? Well, the negative charges that were supposed to be there um, are being canceled out by the positive charges that are there. Now this is really important, why? Because in an air data system like the autopilot, uh, you start out from Roseville, which I think is like 950 feet above uh, sea level, and you're going to fly to Denver. It's a mile high city, 5,280 at the, you know, close to the stadium. I don't know where the heck they're measuring it. But anyway, you got to know something, right? You got to know something, because it is perfectly acceptable for your air data system to tell you that you're 10 feet off the runway, unless you have a shift and you're actually one foot under the runway. You lose a lot of customers. That's a real bummer. So how do you know? How do you know where you are and how high you are? Well, you've got to have all sorts of input. Let's say you're flying from here to Denver. You know that Denver is 5,000 and a couple hundred feet above sea level. You're at 950. So as you're flying across the country, you already have to gain 4,000 feet just to stay even, right? So how do you know? Second of all, let's say there's this big storm over Kansas. It happened. Look what happened to Oregon. Storms tend to be low pressure, right? So all of a sudden you fly into and through the storm and on the back side of the storm, you're low pressure compared to the brilliant sunny skies here in Minnesota, which happens when it's colder than heck. <laughs> anyway, so so now you now you all you you have to gain four thousand feet in altitude and still have that equal zero right because zero is when you touch down and you just did low pressure which means hmm which way does the plane go well if pressure if high pressure forces this up and makes it a higher capacitance low pressure sucks it down makes it a lower pressure so now you're comp you're doing competing competing things how do you know. Well, here's what you do. You program the height into a computer, the height where you start, 
the hyperemic end. And then you understand what the barometric pressure is at the start and at the end, and in the center. And that has to come from a computer and outside measurements. Some of those measurements are on the plane, but others have to come from something outside of the environment because the plane can't tell whether you went through a low pressure system or whether you just went up a little bit, right? If you go up, you get lower pressure. Anyway, that, that's a big deal. And so particles, particles can physically block something from moving. But, but if you're gonna use pressure sensors to guide your data system, then you absolutely positively have to have outside input and you have to be able to, you have to, be able to um, discern what is going on with the plane. So how do you do that? You, you gotta keep mobile ions out of there. You, you, can't, you can't compensate for a charge you don't know is there and is variable. That's a bummer. So we have to be very careful. So when we go into areas that have mobile, we, the, the, the charges like potassium and, and sodium, we have to use some materials that have those in it in order to make the device. So we're using the very same things that could cause you to crash into a tree in an airplane at 600 miles an hour, which is pretty bad. The, the, those same things have to be meticulously removed after they're used. So we wipe down our surfaces often. After you're done, you wipe it up. Not like home, because I mean, mom's doing a pretty good job usually, but she's getting a little bit you know, with age and not wiping stuff off as much and the ants are really taking care of the rest. We have to be very careful, we have to be very careful to wipe down uh, for chemical con uh, contaminants. Even our water is special in a bath. It has no contaminants in it. It's darn near pure. It's 18 mega ohm centimeter water. 18 mega ohm, million ohm. That means if old, Remember, remember uh, uh, Ben Franklin? Dude, dude wanted to prove that lightning was electricity, right? So he, he got himself an electroscope. He stuck it on the ground and he attached a, uh, a string to a key and then flew a kite in a lightning storm. And he was going to just have that lightning come down the, the thing and, and uh, fill up an electroscope and prove that it was, prove that lightning was electricity. If, if old Ben Franklin were standing in our water, he would have been safe. It doesn't conduct electricity. In fact, our, our deionized water uh, is so starved for ions that it etches metal. So you could stick your car in there and go away for a few hours and have a little bit of rust and some you know seeds floating on top. It, it's bad news water. You don't want to drink that stuff. It's also poisonous because hey, it wants to eat you. So the um, anyway, so we are we are we are worried about particles. We're worried about contamination. I'm going to switch gears for just a minute. Remember, I told you it took 80 days just to get the wafers out, and then you have to saw them up, and then you have to package them, and then you have to put those packages into a transducer, and the transducer has to go on a circuit card. The circuit card has to go into a system. Then the whole system has to be built up. We cannot afford to not know what's going on. But, but you Sparkies, you know that if you can't conduct electricity in and out of something because there's no cord in it, then you don't know what the state of that thing is. And so we have, we've just got to know early. How do you know? How do you know? It takes 70 days before you get metal on the surface and before you can put a probe on it. How do you know that that's gonna, gonna work? Why would you put another why would you put another 50 days of processing, very expensive processing into something that isn't going to work? And how do you plan for when you're going to scrap stuff? How do you plan for that? These are very expensive. The wafers cost I don't know, $1,000, $1,500 if you're if you're making integrated circuits, they probably cost 10 or $15,000 by the time they're made. That's a lot of, you know, if you're making computer chips, how much does a computer chip cost? Right, you're just going to go buy a 500 bucks. That's one chip. You're making a thousand at a time. So we, we have to be very careful. So what we do is we, we do statistical process control. 
And statistical process control means that we have uh, we have every process that we put our, our our devices through is being watched. It's it's got it's got an average where we want it. There's some natural variation, and if you notice these red lines, the red lines are three times the standard deviation. So whatever the data has a standard deviation, the red lines are plus or minus three standard deviations away from the mean. And what that really means is three standard deviations is 99.96%. Uh, percent of any point here means it probably actually was that point. So if you go out, then it's, there's only 0.001% chance that this was actually a good part. This, the statistics help you out. We know then if we're making good parts by just monitoring that chunk. So each chunk of that process, if we just, if we put uh, oxide on top of the silicon, just like frosting on a cake, we know at that point, if that oxide is the right thickness, then it's very likely the, all of the dye on that wafer and all of those wafers in the lot will be okay at that step. That's all we know is at that step. At the next step, if we etch a hole in that oxide and the hole goes all the way down to the silicon, if, if we can measure that there's no oxide left in there or, or how thick the oxide is in there, then we can know at that step, only for that step, that it's gonna be okay. But you see, if you measure every step, every tool and every process on the tool, you can pretty much assure that it's gonna be okay, that that thing will yield, unless somebody pulls a moron move and goes, <coughs> hacks on it, or scratches something and physically breaks it. So um, the, the, the takeaway here, this is not a happy slide, it's not an interesting slide, there's nothing particular to read here. But when you guys get out in the industry, make sure that you find a statistical process control course, either inside your company or outside. Figure it out. This is gonna save, this has saved a lot of hind ends. It really has. Knowing when to scrap is, is as important as knowing that things are gonna go well. So just, just make sure that, that uh, just make sure that you find an SPC course. Now let me tell you why. Um, how many people think that perhaps Toyota cars are better than uh, the Yugo or the, I don't know, pick some other manufacturer. Most people do. Here's what happened in the United States. There's a guy named Edwards Deming, and he got together with uh, Walter Schuart, and Schuart invented the statistical process control. It's, it's applied statistics. And uh, Deming took this to the, uh, took this to the American car manufacturers and said, look, we should be doing these things because we'll know things are gonna fit better as, as the stamping tools wear out. You know, as, as uh, stamping tools wear out, then your, 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 uh, uh, your tolerances become bigger and bigger until they finally don't work quite right. We can make cars better if we do this. And nobody listened here. So where'd he go? He went to Japan and he showed Toyota Toyota adopted statistical process control. Back when I was a kid and um, girlfriend had a little Toyota, it was a rust bucket, it was terrible. By the time, by the time I was an adult and could grow facial hair, the <laughs> Toyota had become the number one manufacturer for quality in the world. And it's because they adopted statistical process control. It, it, it really increased their, uh, their uh, owner confidence People bought more of them, their profit margins went up, their scrap rights went down. Make sure that you find a statistical process control course and take it. In fact, one of the things I'm gonna tell your professors is that they need to have that for engineers. So don't, don't lose out on that. Look, our cycle times are long. We can't afford to wait to find out. We need to control each process and each tool. We need to be able to enter that data into a data system so we know whether our processes are starting to drift. Um, it, uh, so I even have, I, I look at about 60 control charts most weeks just to make sure that my processes are gonna make it. Here's the other thing that you need to do. You need to know about design of experiments. Most people think 
I got these three things and, uh, and, and, and I'm gonna ex perform an experiment and I'm gonna hold these two the same and I'm gonna change this and I'm gonna hold this one the same and I'm gonna keep these, or I mean, I'm gonna change this one and keep these the same and then I'm gonna change this one and keep these the same. Turns out that's an extraordinarily inefficient way to design an experiment. And you never find an interaction. What does it mean like interactions? Well, some of us have heard about the COVID shots. The first one goes in, you kind of get a little sore and you drag. Second one, a lot of people get, uh, get kind of put down for a day, right? We've, we've heard that second shot might be a real bear. Doesn't happen to everybody. But, but if you only ever saw the first shot, you'd never know that the interaction of the two shots causes you to have a, or causes some people to have a fairly high reaction on the second shot. You never would see it. Why? You inject it, it worked. Didn't hurt anybody, your arm kind of felt sore, but it always does anyway, and the tetanus shot's worse, right? But, but you don't see an interaction. The interaction is there, it really is. And, but you won't see it by not designing the experiment well. So when you get out, look for design of experiments. Don't be content with just changing stuff to see what happens. It turns out it's very inefficient and extremely time consuming and very expensive. Um, proper design of experiments uh, will get you raises. Pretty soon you're making as much in the company you own the place and then you tell other people to do stuff. Let's get back to something more interesting. How sensitive are our, our MEMS pressure sensors? At 600 miles an hour and 3,700 feet, or 37,000 feet above sea level, we can tell whether the plane went up or down about 10 feet or eight feet. At sea level, we know when a plane goes up or down one foot. That's by pressure. Now, your ears pop when you go up a hill, but your ears didn't pop when you sat down at your desk. Here, this big plane is flying along, and it can tell whether it went up or down this far by atmospheric pressure differences. That's astounding. That's just plain astounding. Here's, if you've ever looked at the nose of the plane, you see all these things that stick off. Most of, the, most of all, you're going into the jet bridge, you don't see those. But if you look at the planes when they're parked, you'll see things are sticking out. This, uh, there's a temperature sensor. In, in order to know silicon, um, I don't know whether you guys have talked about silicon properties yet, but silicon resistance changes proportional to temperature. So you gotta know what the temperature is. And if you take off in Phoenix, you go to 38,000 feet, you're going from about 120 degrees on the black tarmac to minus 40 degrees centigrade, second to minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit, right? The, the, the silicon has changed a lot. It's, its ability to understand what it's doing depends on temperature. So you have to have an independent temperature measurement on your plane. Here's one of those right here. This thing though, this is this, and this mounts flush into the system of the plane. It's got a, a big vein on it, and then it's got a pressure port here and two ports there. This is machined so that, uh, so that it's kind of like an airplane wing. And the pressure, of course, looking forward, tells you, tells you your airspeed, which is not your ground speed, right? If you're flying into a headwind, you may not be going very fast compared to the ground, or if you're flying with a tailwind, you won't be, you'll be going faster. Obviously, you can't load up the plane. Planes are designed to only go so fast. If they go too fast, then you get too much, uh, you get too much stress on the fronts of the wings and you can snap them off. That's, uh, that's a real cosmetic thing. I mean, if you see a plane with like one wing in the airport, you probably don't want to ride it. The, however, these two ports here, these two ports allow you as the wind is rushing past the front port. They're just sticking there like ears. Your ears don't take as much of a blast when you're, when you're hanging your head out of the uh, car going about 60 miles an hour like your dog does. Your ears don't take as much of a blast as your, as your face does, right? So we can measure differential pressure. We can measure the actual pressure in the atmosphere on those side ports. And the, the probe is actually contoured so that you get the, so that it integrates the, the slipstream coming around the nose of the plane with the probe port. Those are, those are tailored to individual planes. 
So we can measure a differential pressure. So then we can get airspeed. If you have these on both sides and your plane is turning, if it goes more than a foot, you can also measure the bank angle. You can measure the angle of attack, whether you're going up or down. All of that by having redundant systems on your plane. You see here, here, there's a temperature measure, there's a temperature measure. I don't know what those things are. My buddy flies for, uh, uh, flew for um, Northwest and then for Delta. He was, he was climbing out of MSP and uh, with the fall, got into a block of yeast and uh, took a few hits on the plane. Luckily, nothing in his engine. Uh, of course, he was immediately, you know, tell the tower you're coming back in because you don't want anything to blow up or, you know, to fall out of the sky. And he came back around. Turns out, if you've got a probe like this and you've got a tiny port like that and you go through a rainstorm, what do you suppose happens? You get water in there. What, and then you fly up that altitude, what happens to the water? It freezes. And then you have a complete plug in your air data system. That's no good. So these things are heated. They're heated uh, very aggressively. They stay the same temperature regardless of how fast you're going and regardless of your, uh, your altitude. Turns out, when they came down, he had a, a goose on the uh, sensor, and uh, it was quite thrilling, thank you very much. <laughs> anyway, what else do we do? We do engine pressure. Here's, a, here's an engine, a jet engine goes into a big plane, and if you look, look around here, you'll see this, this rim of wires. Inside there, and inside the combustion, on here, we have, to, we have to measure the combustion, just like the oxygen sensor in your car measures the amount of oxygen sent into the cylinder. We have to measure the amount of combustion so that you can optimize the fuel and oxygen ratios. It takes an awful, uh, uh, robust sensor to sit there in the flames and the pressure of the jet engine, don't you think? We do that with our assembly. Here's another thing that's kind of cool. We have a photo tube. This is a tube that if it were aimed forward, the envelope up there on the tube is actually a filter for, uh, for uh, sunlight frequencies. And it, so it filters out sunlight, but it looks at frequencies that are common to flames, particularly jet fuel flames. So this thing sits in a fighter plane and looks to see if the fighter is uh, you know, on fire um, and other things like that. It also, there are also sensors just like this that look forward. So if you're in a dogfight, the, the, uh, uh, the plane and the missile systems can lock onto the exhaust of the, uh, a fighter in front of you. However, it's not too good to have your systems go firing off at the sun or a reflection. So this tube filters out sun and keeps certain frequencies that are in flames. That's a humongous tube. Any of you that, that, have, that have seen an old tube radio with a tube, tube transistors and stuff in there, that's what those look like. This can all be replaced by a little chunk of silicon that's this big. There's a lot of, it, it's a lot easier to manage. It doesn't weigh as much and, and weight in an airplane makes a difference. How about this? This is gas detection system. This little chip here inside that, inside this package sits on a printed circuit board and sits there and sniffs. Now, as you go across the Lakota Bridge over the, on 494 over the Mississippi River, you look down to the south and you see the, the, uh, the, uh, the refinery down there, right? And you see that, uh, especially if you go over in the evening, you see the burner tips where they're, they're blowing um, uh, gas and other things out of the refined crude oil and making it acceptable so they don't poison their neighbors downwind, right? The, the, turns out um, hydrogen sulfide uh, is, is often dissolved in crude petroleum. Hydrogen sulfide, H2S, is the stuff that makes rotten eggs stink. In, but in higher concentrations than rotten eggs, uh, it is a toxic gas. You have to be very careful with it. So if you're, if you're in a refinery, you need to have sniffers around the sides of your, uh, sides of your refinery so that if something escapes, if something burps, you don't poison the neighbors. 
And so we make, we make gas detectors. These are really cool because uh, tin dioxide, we, we've, got, we've got two electrodes, we've got tin dioxide between them. The tin dioxide changes five orders of magnitude in resistance. If it's held, at, if tin dioxide is held at precisely the right temperature, when it sniffs H2S. So if you can hold that thing at the right temperature, if you can assure that it's gonna be there, then you'll see a five order, five order of magnitude shift in resistance, at which point you, that automatically lights up the board inside the plant, somebody hits the button and stops the production and keeps us from poisoning people. Back in my day when I was your age, there was a plant in India that belched stuff that killed 4,000 people downwind and, and it hurt 20,000 people. 20,000 people were hurt, 4,000 people were killed. And it was because a, a chemical plant accidentally vented something and they didn't even know it. That's, that's a huge, huge cost. These sensors probably cost 10 or 15 bucks. You can afford to be safe. Here's something, this, this is a single axis gyroscope. Um, and this is the one, actually it's a hemispherical resonator. There's a hemisphere right there. How many of you are familiar with the old ladies with blue hair that ring, uh, ring uh, the handbells at church, right? Sometimes if you're watching them, they'll ring the handbell and then they'll swing it. Anybody been in a handbell choir? There you go, right? You swing it and it, does, it goes wong, wong, right? It changes frequency, it changes pitch. It turns out that's called the Coriolis effect. When, when, a, when a, a resonator goes through an acceleration, it changes frequency and you can pick that up. So imagine, imagine then if, if you have this mounted in this direction and I go this way, it will, it will change its frequency coming out of the resonator, just like that bell does in handbell. Well, these are the gyros that were on the Apollo spacecraft. They needed one in each direction, in X, in Y, and in Z. And then they needed a second set in case the first set didn't work. And I, I don't know whether they were just double redundant or triple redundant, but look at the size of these things. This thing, weighs about a, I don't know, some fraction of a pound. Pounds make a difference to rockets. Here's the same thing. Only that's a three-dimensional accelerometer. Three of these, one of those. This is the same technology, ladies and gentlemen, that allows you to have virtual bowling with your, with your Wii. <laughs> oh my goodness, guys. <laughs> All right, here's what we do. Uh, let's see, what time do you guys leave? 855. 8.55. 8.55, okay. <laughs> um, so we have, we, have this, we have a membrane under here, and we have a Wheatstone bridge. If you don't know Wheatstone bridges by the time you leave this class, go be a business major. <laughs> I'm serious. Wheatstone bridges are very important. Here's a Wheatstone bridge. We've got four resistors on it. Pressure comes up. This is like a trampoline, and it moves like this. It turns out silicon... Silicon varies greatly with stress and strain. So if it bends, it's directly proportional to the silicon resistance. Here's another one. We make a capacitor. Here's a, a silicon membrane on an on a electrode below. And this moves in this direction and the capacitance changes with pressure. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put in some free advice. First of all, I told you, the airflow in the fab is important. We have perforated tables, so, it try, it, so we try not to interrupt the airflow so things come down. Second of all, if you don't think taking a lab notebook is important now, wait till you get to, uh, wait till you get to your job. It's really important. There's a couple good reasons for that. First of all, you take data, you gotta have it someplace. You can type it in, I don't, it doesn't matter what form your notebook's in, but it's, that it's there is very important. That's the first thing. The second thing is, your boss has about a two week memory. When it comes time for evaluation, you can, if you have your notebook, tell them what you did all year long, not just what happened in the last two weeks. Raise to the cream of the crop, get a little bit extra in your paycheck that month, 
and ta-da, you're great. Document everything. Listen, no matter how tight the schedule, no matter how much pressure you have to ship, write it down. You will never regret writing things down. Don't give verbal commands. Write things down. Uh, write down your parameters. You think that the process is not going to change? It will. Somebody will get in there and change your process. If you don't have it written down, you won't be able to recover quickly. At, um, you, you need to write down your equations you use. If somebody else has your uh, needs to see how you calculated something, you have to be able to show them right away. You have to be able to speak to that. And you're going to be doing multiple projects at once. And you'll never have enough time. And then, I mean, I used to look young like you guys. But I've been at it for 38 years. It takes it out of you a little bit. Write everything down. Write down your assumptions. Make sure you can find everything. Don't miss. Listen, build trust. Spend time on the floor with your operators and your technicians. Spend time with the supervisors so that they have some clue what their operators are doing. Spend time with the maintenance guys and the facilities guys. If you don't think they're important, you're wrong. That our guy, our guy found a uh, found an odd looking something kind of growing on one of our metal racks. Turns out one of our hoods was leaking gas. It was leaking gas, not the acid that was in it, just the just the uh, gas that was over the top of the acid. It was corroding things. That sort of corrosion could have caused us uh, a half a year's worth of production. But that guy's my friend, just like my colleagues are my friends. And he came to me and said, John, I found something I think you're going to be interested in, and I don't know what it is. And so we go in and we're thinking, holy cow, the rack that we're, we're keeping our material on is corroding. And that sort of corrosion is both particulate and chemical corrosion. Those are the two that we talked about earlier. The guy saved us. Um, and I'm very, very, very happy that I made that acquaintance, that I, that I took time to invest in that guy, because he took time to invest in me. Look, beware of unintended consequences. This is, this is key. Be quick to understand your problem and be slow and cautious to implement a fix. Don't do something unless you've checked with everybody. Listen, when you're an engineer, if you don't talk to everybody every day about everything that you plan on doing because you think you're competent, that's gonna get you in trouble. Involve everybody in your product, involve everybody in your decisions. Look, um, sometimes you can't see a risk that somebody knows about. Make sure you involve them. And then finally, never ascribe to mediocrity, never. Hard work and fine character pay off, so do your best. And then, while you're doing your best, make sure you find a way to show kindness. I'll show you this. Um, these guys, there they are intently looking at this wafer. First of all, they're staring at the backside, and second of all, they don't have safety glasses on. That's an OSHA problem right there. All right, if you have any questions, I'll be available. Um, have a good day, and uh, thanks for letting me uh, come by.